Welcome to the Science of Success with your host, Matt Bodner. Welcome to the Science of Success. I'm your host, Matt Bodner. I'm an entrepreneur and investor in Nashville, Tennessee, and I'm obsessed with the mindset of success and the psychology of performance. I've read hundreds of books, conducted countless hours of research and study, and I'm going to take you on a journey into the human mind and what makes peak performers tick, with a focus on always having our discussions rooted in psychological research and scientific fact, not opinion. In this episode, we explore the mental game of world champion performers, examine the emotional issues preventing you from achieving what you want to achieve, how those issues happen in predictable patterns that you can discover and solve, look at why people choke under pressure, and discuss how to build mental toughness with mental game coach Jared Tendler. Because the science of success has spread across the globe with almost 500,000 downloads, listeners in over 100 countries, hitting number one new and noteworthy, and much more, I'm giving something away to my listeners every single week. This month, I'm giving away a $100 Amazon gift card to one lucky listener. All you have to do to be entered to win is to text the word SMARTER, that's S-M-A-R-T-E-R, to the number 44222. Again, to be entered to win a $100 Amazon gift card, all you have to do is text the word SMARTER, that's S-M-A-R-T-E-R, to the number 44222. And if you want 10, yes, 10 extra entries into the giveaway, leave a positive review on iTunes and email me a screenshot of that review to matt at scienceofsuccess.co, that's M-A-T-T at scienceofsuccess.co. In our previous episode, we explored one of the biggest things disrupting your sleep, examined strategies for getting a better night's rest, dug into sleep cycles, talked about the 30-day no alcohol challenge, and broke down how to read books more effectively with James Swanick. If you want to sleep better and be more productive, listen to that episode. Today, we have another amazing guest on the show, Jared Tendler. Jared is an internationally recognized mental game coach. His clients include world champion poker players, the number one ranked pool player in the world, professional golfers, and financial traders. He's the author of two highly acclaimed books, The Mental Game of Poker 1 and 2, and host of the popular podcast, The Mental Game. Jared, welcome to the show. Thanks, man. Uh, Good to be here. So, Jared, for listeners who may not be familiar with you, tell us a little bit about kind of your story and your background. I was an aspiring professional golfer, you know, as a kid, uh, kind of got a little bit of a late start, you know, around 13, 14 is when I started really taking it seriously. Uh, this is kind of pre tiger, you know, in his, uh, in his heyday, I kind of grew up uh, maybe like three or four years behind him in terms of amateur golf. So I'm 38 now I'm saying that in part because if you get started as a, as an aspiring golfer at 13 years old right now, you're severely behind uh, the eight ball. Uh, the game has just become so, so highly competitive. So I was behind the eight ball 25 years ago. Uh, and, and today it would be even worse, but got to college, you know, and was able to become a three-time all American, uh, played some big national events, uh, and in particular, uh, the U S open, uh, qualifier and, and was finding myself choking. So I was having a lot of success, in sort of the smaller events, more regional events. But when I was getting to the big stage, I was choking. And, you know, it was, was really on the cusp of being able to break through, but it was sort of my, my mental and emotional issues that was blocking me. So rather than become a professional golfer, I'm not one to just kind of try something just to, for the sake of trying it. I, I needed to feel like I actually had a chance of being successful. Um, I went to get a master's degree in counseling psychology uh, and then subsequently got licensed as a traditional therapist really to, to better understand uh, the reasons why I was choking and the reasons why I think a lot of uh, athletes, in particular golfers, that their game doesn't perform uh, under that kind of pressure as well as they'd like. And, and the reason I did that is because what I felt like was the predominant mode of sports psychology at the time was very sort of surface level. It was, you're not focused, you're, you're losing confidence, you're, you're getting too anxious, we're going to teach you how to focus, how to be confident, uh, how to relax uh, in those environments. And it didn't really understand kind of the, the why. Like, why was I not confident? Why was my focus elsewhere? Why was I thinking about the future or the past? Uh, and, and I thought, uh, to me, that was the, I think, the essential question to ask in order to find the real cause of the problem so that sustainable improvements could be made. So I made a lot of improvements using the typical sports psychology advice. My game got better. 
I, I was certainly performing better by the time I was a senior than I was a freshman. But the essential pattern of really breaking down under that big time stress hadn't changed. And I felt like there was something deeper that had to be, uh, had to be found. And so after I got my, my master's degree uh, and felt like I had kind of understood the problem solving methodology of, of a therapist, uh, I flew to uh, Arizona um, and started up my, my golf psychology practice and was kind of cold calling uh, and knocking on country club doors trying to find some pr- uh, swing instructors for me to partner with. Uh, I felt like, you know, if I could have some kind of uh, a strong relationship between uh, another instructor that, that the two of us could kind of create like a, a well-rounded team for uh, especially professional golfers, but even, you know, really ser- serious amateurs or junior players. Uh, and that's what I did. And so I, I was working with, with golfers for about three and a half years uh, before poker uh, came about and which, you know, kind of defined my career for the last eight years. So how did you get into the world of poker? So poker was somewhat spontaneous. Um, I had actually begun playing some professional golf myself, uh, was, it felt like I had solved a lot of the issues that I had needed to, and, uh, was playing some of the best golf in my life. Uh, got hooked up with, with a group of guys, um, that, uh, one, one of which was a former professional golfer and, and he, uh, unfortunately had to, uh, stop playing golf because he had a, had a heart attack at 22, you know, was not drug induced. It was, uh, some, you know, sort of genetic mutation that caused his, his heart to kind of, or his, the arteries to spasm. Uh, and so he ended up going into professional online poker and it was an interesting transition. I mean, the guy was an incredibly hard worker. Uh, in, in with his, prof- with his, with his golf growing up was the guy that was out of the driving range, spending hours and hours, uh, hitting balls and was kind of just like the equivalent of a gym rat, uh, in, in golf. Um, he, he actually broke Tiger Woods's record at 13 years old for most, uh, tournament victories in, in the state of California in one summer. I think he won 35 events. So it was a guy who was, you know, had a lot of, of competence in working and obviously as a player. And, and then saw online poker back in 2000, I think 2004, 2005 is when he started. This was during the poker boom, the online poker boom, uh, prior to when the, the, when the government stepped in, there was a lot of money to be made and he was making around 20 to $30,000 per month, uh, when he and I met. And the reason that he ended up seeking my advice for, uh, psychologically was because he was getting so angry that he was literally like taking his desktop computer and ripping it out of the wall and smashing it and breaking monitors and mice and keyboards. You know, in poker, there's a lot of short-term luck. You know, imagine a golfer hitting a perfect drive down the middle of the fairway and it hitting a sprinkler head and going straight out of bounds and then doing that five times in a row. And so you're in a professional golf tournament and you make a 15 on a hole, you know, nine or 10 over par, and, and you don't you even hit a bad shot. In, in poker, that happens every single day. The better players lose a lot because of the short-term luck. And, and that's important as a professional poker player because that's where a lot of their money is made. And not necessarily just the differential in skill, but in the differential in the perception of skill. Bad players need to win in order to think that they're good, in order for them to play against players who are the equivalent of you know, a, a, a 15 handicap golfer playing up against a, a PGA tour player and not getting any strokes to, to even out the match. I mean, there's never a scenario where, where that, that PGA tour player is going to lose to that player or imagine, you know, the New York Yankees playing up against the high school uh, baseball team. There's never a scenario where the, where the Yankees are losing, but in poker, that dynamic happens every single day. The best players in the world lose to some of the worst players in the world. And, and that's a reality. And so for him, dealing with that reality was incredibly difficult, especially coming from golf, where he had a lot more control over his results. So our interactions began with, you know, me kind of, you know, kind of doing uh, a typical dissection of my clients. I have them fill out a very detailed questionnaire to try to understand what their what their issues are. And, and then we get to work. And, you know, within a few months, uh, his the results were almost too obvious to to know. I mean, it was he went from, as I said, making twenty to thirty thousand dollars a month to making um, one hundred and fifty uh, to two hundred thousand dollars a month. And and yes, there's certainly can be some good luck involved in that. But for the most part, being able to remain calm, remain focused, be in the zone more, 
uh, was a big part of his success. And, and so he happened to be part owners in an online training site that taught people how to play poker, which was a new phenomenon at the time. And because it was new and there wasn't really anybody doing sort of sports psychology in poker, it gave me sort of a, a big avenue for, for me to kind of take my job. And, you know, I, as I said, I started playing some professional golf. And so it became a, a, a difficult sort of choice point. You know, do I pursue my dream or do I, you know, take on this seemingly risky thing to just hop into poker? And, and I decided that it was going to cost about $250,000 over two or three years to try to make it as a professional golfer. And, you know, I was getting older at the point, at this point, I was 27. Um, so it was a risk. And I decided that, that poker was the safer bet. And I would kind of just kind of dive into it, continue to play some tournaments and, and see where it went. And it, and it just sort of took off. And, and I just had a, a large influx of clients very quickly and, and really just saw a huge opportunity within that field. And, and it gave me a chance really to, to, to work with players longer term, you know, the golfers seemingly were a lot, a lot more fickle. They, they wanted results quickly. They're the people who, you know, buy clubs, you know, regularly thinking that that's the solution. And, and even the professionals, they wanted things faster than the process would kind of allow for. But, but for some reason, poker players, you know, maybe because it's the money, the money was, was happening every day. It was like working with a, you know, a, an employee at a, or just somebody who's working a business, you know, golfers don't, don't play tournaments every single day that the poker players just seemed to be committed to it. So it really was, was very, it was a lot of fun for me to, to work with people who were really committed to, to doing that kind of work. And that, that was eight years ago, uh, 2007, uh, 2008, when I got started with that website. And, you know, at this point I've worked with well over 500 poker players, some of the best players in the world. Uh, as I mentioned, as you mentioned, the, the books that I've written, um, it's, it's been a, a very, uh, enjoyable ride, uh, going through, through poker. So I definitely want to dig into smashing computers and dealing with tilt and all of that. <laughs> um, but before we do, tell me, why do people choke? There are lots of reasons. One reason can be that their expectations are too high relative to their, their actual capacity. There sometimes can be some traumatic experiences. Uh, and then, you know, those traumatic experiences then continue to get replayed you know, the mind has the ability to kind of imprint uh, a memory. Uh, and so then it's, you know, in a physical capacity, that like motor pattern gets replayed, gets triggered when the circumstances cause a lot of stress. Uh, from a decision-making standpoint, the mind has the ability, or the brain, I should say, the brain has the ability to, to shut down higher brain function. Uh, people often uh, are familiar with what's called the, the fight or flight mechanism, right? So if you are in a blind rage, that is the equivalent of being, of choking, uh, except we're talking about the difference between anger and pressure. But, but both circumstances are caused by the same tripping of that, the wiring in your brain where, where higher brain function uh, gets shut off. If you're feeling euphoric, right, uh, on your wedding day or, you know, uh, your child gets born, there's this rush of emotion and it shuts down higher brain function. You know, my daughter is two years old now. If I was told, you know, right after she was born that I had to make some very complex calculations or I had to help somebody, you know, with a very severe problem, there's no way that I could do that, right? The emotions are too intense. And that mechanism, you know, goes back to very primitive processes in our brain. And I'm sure you've talked a lot about this in your podcast. The key in my mind is that we have to understand what creates that tripping, right? What's causing that excessive emotion in, you know, more normal circumstances, right? You know, marriage and, and baby aside, you know, and when we're able to understand what that is, then we can decrease the neurological activity in the emotional center so that the higher brain functions can actually click back in and you're able to make decisions or as an athlete, you're able to, to think through and see and perceive you know, the environment around you to, to know what to do, right? As a golfer, you need your senses to be able to perceive the environment, to have your body react to that particular shot. And the same is true with a lot of athletes, right? If you lose that perception, right, then your, your capacity as an athlete uh, is severely diminished but what often remains is those expectations that you should be able to perform at levels that would be the case without that severe emotion present. And that is what causes, or at least is a big cause of, of people choking, is that differential. And in, the, in their minds, not being able to reconcile that difference. It's basically like, like if you were to, uh, if I were to put you on the edge of a cliff and, and it was, let's say, 30 feet wide, and I would say, Matt, I want you to jump across that. 
right? You should choke <laughs> at, at attempting to do that, right? You should not do it because it's an impossible thing to do. Uh, but when players are faced with a similar kind of chasm, they don't realize how big the gap is between what they're, what they're normally expecting them, of themselves and what they're actually capable of in that moment. And that causes predictable paralysis and causes people to choke. What creates the the tripping or kind of trips the wire of excessive emotion? And I know there may be many different causes, but kind of in have you seen some commonalities among what triggers that in people? Yeah, it, it's so the the tripping I would call a trigger, and I think that comes from cognitive psychology or uh, cognitive behavioral psychology and therapy. All right, so it's not a new term, right? but these these triggers, these things that spark the emotion, can be. There's almost like an infinite amount uh, of things that it could be, but the commonalities would be losing, making mistakes, uh, seeing somebody else successful, uh, right? That might spark, uh, you know, uh, judgment or or some jealousy. Um, actually, winning can actually cause excessive emotions at time too. But you know, it's it's the the dynamics of the game uh, are, are are varied, right? And so we sort of extrapolate, you know, within poker, within golf, within trading, you know, what does winning and losing look like? What do mistakes look like? And those are going to be, you know, by and large, a lot of the things that people are going to be triggered by. Now, the the reaction that they have is, is going to be varied, right? Some people are going to feel like, like losing causes a sense of injustice. Some people are going to feel like they deserve uh, not to get bad luck or do they deserve to win. Uh, some people are going to feel like their sense of competitive balance is, is, is off and they're going to feel like they're, uh, they're fighting for their goals, and so they're going to be triggered in that way. Uh, other people are going to have some wishes that they could win more. Uh, they're going to lose some confidence and, and you know, f- ha- have difficulty not being able to control the outcome or uh, believing that, that when they win, that, they sh- that means that they should always win. So there's, there's a lot of reactions that happen that can you know, cause more of the chaotic array of emotional issues that come about. But I think that's, that's a lot of it. And what do you advise people to do to, to kind of in the moment decrease that neurological activity that is caused by excess emotion? There's a few things. Number one, you have to understand the cause of that excessive emotional activity. So the things that I've mentioned so far, you know, they may or may not necessarily get to the root of it, right? So if you don't have a, a sense of the root cause, then your attempts in the moment to to control the emotion, which is really all you can do, uh, is minimized. So, for example, you take somebody who has um, a sense of entitlement, right? And so that sense of entitlement causes them to get angry at situations where you know they think that the outcome should be different, and and they get uh, very pissed off about that, right? A sense of entitlement often comes as a result of a weakness in confidence. Right and some overconfidence. Well, that overconfidence may be a, may be caused by an illusion of control, right? And so they believe that they're in more control of the outcome than is real. So the reaction that is entitlement, right? That in the moment frustration that they're not getting the results that they want requires a reminder that speaks to that illusion of control. And so you might have a a statement that says something like, uh, you know, I can't control all of the results. Like no one can, right? There's short term luck. There's short term things that I can't control, like, like the actions of other players or competitors. Uh, and, and so all I can control are X, Y, and Z, or all I can control is how well I'm focused, how well I'm, I'm prepared, how well I'm playing, whatever might be specific to that person. And, and they're using that statement as, as, a, as a way of correcting that deeper flaw, which is critical to long-term resolution of the issue. And in the short term, it creates some control so that they're able to decrease a little bit of that emotion and, and actually continue to make good decisions or, or perform well. Uh, but the process I use um, requires several steps to get to that point. Number one is recognition early on. Right? The longer that it takes for you to recognize that your emotions are rising, the harder it is for you to use that logic, to use that statement to gain control of the emotion. Right? And it should make sense. Right? The bigger the emotion, the more strength is required to control it. The faster you can identify it, 
you know, when it's small, the more uh, of an effect it will have, right? Because that same dynamic is at play, which is that when the emotions rise too high, they shut down higher brain function proportionally to that size of the emotion. So the, the more, the bigger the emotion is, the weaker your mind is and the weaker that statement will have as you say it in those moments. And I actually think this is one of the biggest mistakes that cognitive behavioral therapists have made, right? Cognitive behavioral, ther- behavioral therapy is one of the most effective treatments for a whole, whole range of, of issues, both, you know, clinical, you know, sort of personal, uh, as well as within the sphere of performance and sports or whatnot. But, but they make a big mistake in, in not emphasizing this point that I'm making now, which is that you have to use that cognition, use your thought process at a time when your thoughts are the most powerful, which is when the emotions are small. And so what I advise people to do is to create very detailed kind of mappings of the escalation of their emotions, right? People, you know, in business or, you know, in sports, in poker and trading, right? The, the issues that we experience happen in very predictable patterns, and it's our job to become aware of that pattern so that we can apply corrections at times where the mind can actually receive it. So it takes a, a little bit of studying. And, and so I advise my clients to spend, you know, a week or two weeks taking detailed notes of the situations in which uh, they're, at, you know, looking for control. Now, one of the cool things about online poker is that there's a high frequency of emotional reactions. And, and so, you know, they may have a bad reaction to losing, you know, happen five times within a particular day. You know, in certain businesses, you may not be faced with, with those situations. It might, might happen, you know, several times a year. But when they do happen, your, your reaction are, is so severe that it is really impairing, you know, your functioning as, a, uh, as an employee or as a, as a business owner. So you got to do your best to, like, in those situations, go back into your, into your memory bank and think about how you've reacted in similar situations in the past. But you don't want to do that just once. I mean, you don't want to spend, you know, one day or one hour thinking about it. You want to spend, let's say, 15 to 20 minutes you know, five times a week for several weeks really thinking about it. Make it a habit where you're trying to uncover and, and articulate the, this pattern. It, it is such an important principle. I can't, I can't overestimate it. That recognition is the X factor. If you can't recognize the emotion prior to it becoming to the point where it's going to shut down higher brain function, you have little to no chance of actually gaining control. And in fact, actually, people with very high expectations really just go completely mental in spots where, you know, they're expecting to be in control, but the emotions are so high. You know, and very often when the emotions are high, you are, it doesn't mean that your brain is completely gone. You still have the ability to think. And you might even know, right, this, this logic statement, you might know what is logical, uh, to correct that emotion, but you're doing it at a time when the emotions are so high that it doesn't have an impact, right? It's, it's so, the emotions are so powerful and so strong that what cognition you have is very weak. But if you have the expectations that what little cognition you have should be able to control that emotion, then, then your mind is just going to blow up, right? It's going to, you're going to become so angry, like, like my friend Dusty, uh, my first poker player who was ripping, uh, his desktop computer out of the wall. So, Again, first step is to recognize, and then in the moment, once you've recognized it and it's small, then you're taking a couple deep breaths, right? Very, very quickly, uh, very, well, I, I say quickly, more to the point is efficiency, right? You don't have to take these long, drawn out, deep breaths, like a meditative kind of thing, right? The, the purpose is more about creating separation between the reaction and the correction, which is the third step, right? The deep breath is the equivalent of stepping out of the room when you're having a heated argument with a friend or a spouse, right? If you just keep fighting, right, or you keep arguing, there doesn't become any chance of kind of coming to some conclusion or some reconciliation of, uh, of the issue, right? When you, when you both step out of the room, cooler heads are able to prevail. You're able to get some perspective. And that's the, that's the idea. The deep breaths give you some space and some separation from that reaction uh, to then be able to apply the logic. Now, if you're in an environment where your decision-making allows you the opportunity to take some longer, deeper breaths to calm down, then, then take that opportunity. It's not going to hurt you, right? But if you're a poker player, if you're a day trader, if you're a golfer, you may not have the, the time or the luxury to be able to spend a minute actually doing some deep breathing to prepare yourself for the logic. 
that third step is injecting that logic, right? The cognitive behavioral strategy of having that correction to that, that root flaw. And then the fourth step is what I call a strategic reminder. And the reason this is important is because just because we've stabilized or controlled our emotions in that moment, it doesn't automatically mean that our performance is going to be as high as we want it to be. So for poker players, they're being reminded of the common mistakes that they might make. Uh, they're thinking about their decision-making process and kind of filling in some of the holes that might typically be there when they're upset. And so they're forcing their attention to correct those mistakes. A golfer might you know, focus on a particular part of their technique or a particular part of their decision-making, right? They may forget to, to calculate the impact of the wind. Uh, and so they got to make sure and force themselves to consider that because just because they're calm again doesn't mean that they're automatically going to think about uh, that part of their decision making or their their performance. And and so while you're competing, you've got to go through that cycle of those four steps over and over again. And and that to me is really how you build mental strength. It's the force that is required to apply these corrections in those moments and repeating them time and time again as they happen uh, throughout your day, throughout your performance. Uh, and, and it's a bit like going to the gym and working out, right? That's where the, the, the strength comes from. It's pushing yourself at a time uh, that's very difficult. And this is you know, less so for athletes that are competing in kind of time-dependent scenarios. You don't want to keep pushing yourself beyond the point where you need to quit, right? You can't just you know, lift a certain amount of weight at the gym 100 times when you can only do it 10 times, right? You want to push yourself to be able to do 12, you know, not 100, right? 100 is, is not doable. So, so quitting, taking breaks, resting is very, very important to the strengthening of the mind, much like it is the body. And so quitting at an appropriate time where you don't risk re-injury uh, is an important part of the overall whole. So we're, we're creating containment. And then day after day, that containment ought to get stronger and stronger you know, if you're allowing your mind to recover. So what are some strategies to boost recognition and train people to more effectively recognize the beginning of an emotional reaction? The first thing is to just start with, start with what's obvious, right? Even if it's at the point past where, where the emotions are, have kind of shut down your, your thinking, uh, you know, you just start writing it down. And, and there's a, a very simple kind of f uh, framework that I use which is called the spectrum of emotion. And, and you just sort of scale it, you know, one to 10 or 10 to one, however you want to describe it. You know, one being, you know, when, when the emotion is at its lowest, 10 being when it's at its highest. And you just start to take notes in each of those 10 spaces about what, what it's like when your emotional reaction is at its lowest point or at its highest point or somewhere in between, you know, somewhere around where you're, your emotional system is shutting down higher brain function. Uh, and you're also paying attention to the changes in your decision making, the changes in your tactical performance. And, and, and so it, you're, you're trying to create a map. This is the map, right? What does the pattern look like, right? So when it's very small, you know, the anger issue might, might appear as some just kind of minor irritation, like some kind of extra noise in your head where you're like, ah, you know, or you kind of sigh deeply or uh, maybe even, you know, like pound the desk a little bit. Not that serious, but you're like, God damn it, you know, and, and so you're writing down uh, the physical changes. You're writing down the, the specific thoughts that you have in your head. Like, I can't believe I was such an idiot, you know, if you're reacting to a mistake. So it's physical reactions, uh, emotional signs, the, the, the specific thoughts that you have or the things that you say out loud, uh, and any of the technical sort of specific to your area of performance that changes at each of those different levels. So, you know, your reaction to a mistake might begin with some, you know, just kind of like tension in your head or you're like, damn it, I, you know, I can't believe I did that. Uh, but when it's at a 10 and you're just in a blind rage about the, the mistakes that you made, or you just can't possibly, uh, you know, even think it's, it's like, you feel like you're just the dumbest person in the world and, uh, and, and can't comprehend how you've made such a, a boneheaded, obvious mistake. And, you know, whatever is going on in your mind at the time is, is what you're writing down. What do you do if you're in the heat of the moment and you apply or try to apply a correction and it doesn't work? In that particular moment, it depends on the scenario, right? If you're a golfer, a poker player, a trader whose performance is so time dependent that you don't really have the ability to take a bigger step backwards, then there's not much you can do. Uh, the only thing you really can do, and this is true for sort of other people as well, is to better understand the pattern, right? If control at that point is gone, 
then your option is to just better understand the pattern because it is going to happen again. And, and the reason it happened this time is because you didn't understand the pattern to begin with or at least understand the cause of it. So it's, let's assume that you, you knew the pattern well, but now you couldn't gain control of it. It means that your injecting logic didn't work. It means that your understanding of the pattern was not strong enough. Or it means that there is an accumulation of emotion that is rapidly overwhelming your mind, right? It's, it is possible for people in a particular moment to get triggered by something so severely that, that their emotions rise so high so quick that it bypasses our ability to actually have any option to inject logic or to inject some cognitive correction. And in which case, we're dealing with a much deeper issue, a much more long-lasting issue that is not going to be corrected in that moment. And you have, to get, you have to do some real, much, much deeper work to uncover the root cause of that and start to break apart that accumulated emotion uh, and give yourself the option to have uh, some, some mental control. So the creation of the of the map of this pattern, is that the, the primary tool you recommend for, let's say, off the felt or when you're not actually in the heat of the moment, building that understanding of the root cause? It's a building of an understanding of what's going on, but it's only sort of the beginnings of, of being able to understand the root cause, right? So the pattern that you're writing about is really like the symptom pattern. And then the root cause is the cause of that symptom. So me thinking I'm an idiot would be uh, the symptom of, uh, let's say, low confidence caused by uh, high expectations, right? This is a, a common phenomenon around a lot of the people that I work with and you know, uh, perhaps a lot of the people that listen to this podcast who uh, believe that high expectations are a good thing. And, and I'm not saying that they're a bad thing, right? High expectations have led to a lot of successes. But what happens is that they can often also add to uh, a reduced sense of confidence, right? Because an expectation implies a guarantee and goals imply learning and development required to achieve the same end outcome, right? So you might think that your expectations are goals, but if you think that what you're aiming for is in essence guaranteed, even if you don't necessarily have the capacity right now to reach that goal, if you assume that you're going to, then it's still, a, still an expectation. And, and what that does is it, it makes the learning process more chaotic. You know, you still might end up achieving the same goal, but you're going to have a feeling like you're an idiot sometimes rather than seeing that, that the mistakes you're making today are way, way less severe than the mistakes you made five years ago. So how could you really be an idiot if you are already that much more capable, right? You're not an idiot, right? It's just that you're overreacting to a mistake because you believe you shouldn't make them. And so the root cause right here is the flaw in, uh, you know, mistaking goals for expectations, right? So we take this sort of symptom pattern and then we drill down and figure out what, what is at the root of it. Then you start correcting the root. And over time, then that symptom pattern starts to dissipate and disappear. Uh, and that is true resolution. That's when you've actually kind of diffused the bomb. You've taken the trigger and make it, made it inert. It no longer is, is going to spark. So now I can make mistakes. And I'm not saying I'm happy about it, but I'm at least dealing with the mistake in a much more objective, rational way towards reaching my end goals, which is ultimately, you know, solving this mistake is, is an essential part of that. So how do we drill down and really kind of get to and understand what that root cause is? That is the most complex part of this whole process. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's, it's, I think at this point, like probably what is my greatest expertise, you know, as a coach is, is being able to kind of work with my clients to, to be able to deduce what's going on behind the scenes. Uh, you know, this is the uncon this is kind of like the unearthing of the unconscious processes behind, uh, our emotional reactions. Um, there's a process that I use, uh, and it's, and it's in the first book. Uh, actually it's in, it's in both books. I think. Um, that helps players to break down their symptoms, uh, their, their issues, uh, to try to identify that root cause. Uh, and it, these are the steps. The first step is to describe the problem in as much detail as you can. So you can certainly build off of that, that map, that spectrum of emotion to, to create and articulate the description of the problem. Uh, the second step is to describe why it makes sense that you would think, feel, or react this way. Now, this is, I think, one of the most important steps for many, many people, because they often think that their emotional reactions are illogical or irrational. And so if you think that your emotions are irrational, 
then then there's really no way to solve it, right? Then there, the fundamental flaw is the emotion itself, right? The anger is the problem. And in my opinion, the anger, the, 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 the fear, the loss of confidence, the loss of motivation, the boredom, the distraction, all of those are symptoms. They're never the actual problem. They're just sort of like the messenger kind of trying to highlight what's going on beneath the surface. So, so you have to change your mentality about problem solving by acknowledging the reality that, that everything that's occurring is, is very logical and predictable. I just don't know the reason yet, right? So it appears to me to be irrational because I don't know why it's actually, ra- because that, why, why it is. Uh, so, so rationality is that second step. Now, I'm not saying that, that that step is without flaw, right? I'm not saying that it's correct long-term, but there is a reason why you're thinking that way, right? So my step one description might be, right, I have very, very strong reactions to mistakes. I really hate making mistakes. Well, why does it make, why does it make sense that I would feel that way? It makes sense because I have high expectations of myself because I hold myself to a really high standard and, and I really want to avoid these mistakes and I, I, I think that they shouldn't be happening. Step three, why is that logic flawed? And this is where we start to get to the root cause. Um, and, as, you know, in the example that I gave before, right, it's, it's my high expectations. I, I'm, I'm equating the learning process or the process of, of, of accomplishing my goals as, as occurring without making mistakes. So my expectations are just, are, are excessive. Uh, they're not realistic. So what is the correction? The correction is I need to be aggressive in my pursuit of my goals and I need to look at, at mistakes as, as the opportunities to grow and, and improve and, and as really as the essential things to actually being able to accomplish my goals. Because if, and, and this is something I tell a lot of my clients, if you are pursuing a goal that is where you're not going to make mistakes, then it's not really something that's really worth chasing. It's, it's too basic. You're not really pushing yourself. You're not really trying. Anything that you've got to try and really push yourself to accomplish, you, you have to make mistakes. It's just, it's inevitable. So that step four in what is the correction oftentimes becomes the injecting logic statement. Uh, and step five is why is that correction correct? And this just sort of looks to get at a little more, more of the theory behind it, right? It's, it's correct because the learning process isn't predictable. I can't always know the mistakes that I'm going to make. That would require me to be a, a psychic, and I'm not psychic. <laughs> so, so I have to make these mistakes. Uh, and, and that theory becomes like kind of extra footing, helping to root the correction kind of in our minds. Uh, because I, I kind of vision, you know, the root system uh, to a bush or to a tree, uh, kind of like the interactions or the intricacies of, you know, the neurons uh, in our mind, right? They, it kind of has a, a visual that is similar. There's a lot of these offshoots. It's not a, just about implanting this very simple idea, mistakes are predictable. It's about the complex idea that you're trying to firmly root, which will then automatically change how you react to them in the future. I love the concept that emotions are the messenger and not the root cause of performance issues. It's the only thing that seems logical to me. I mean, I, I think in large measure, they've been denigrated for a long time, but they have, they have particular messaging when you pay attention to it, right? Anger is the emotion of conflict, right? That conflict can exist between people. That conflict can exist within ourselves, right? Fear or anxiety is the, the messenger for uncertainty, right? There's lots of uncertainty in the world, certainly in business. If you're making an investment where, you know, there is a hundred percent certainty, well, then there's probably not much reward for that, that investment. You know, you're, you're buying, you know, us treasury bonds that are paying next to nothing. The more uncertainty that exists, uh, the greater the reward is, the greater the investment will pay off. And that's true with poker players, with golfers, with athletes as well. Uh, confidence, right? The emotion of confidence. And that's, an, I think, an important distinction because I think people very often are not thinking about confidence as an emotion, right? Confidence is a reflection of skill and competence. But more importantly, it's our perception of our skill and our competence. So it's not just a pure reflection of our competence. If that were the case, my God, poker would not be profitable, right? The world would be a very, a much more simple place, right? <laughs> but, but we have our own biases, our own perceptions of our skill and competence that plays into our feeling of confidence. So, you know, when you're looking at dissecting what the messenger of confidence is saying, it's, it's a measurement of your perception of skill and a measurement of your actual skill. Uh, motivation is a byproduct of your goals, Right? And so it's going to reflect conflicts between goals. It's going to reflect uh, inconsistencies or uh, goals that are too high or too low. Uh, and, and your motivation is going to be 
uh, affected uh, based on those those flaws. So let's let's flip this on its head a little bit. I'm curious, what are some common traits you see among people who have uh, incredible sort of mental strength or or really peak mental performers? They have, I think, a, like an almost intuitive or innate understanding of the learning process. Uh, the learning process is something that I think many people get wrong. Uh, and don't realize how much emotional chaos gets created as a result of it. You know, my, my example of mistakes is a perfect example of that. So they have a very intuitive process or innate process for understanding the learning. They have a, a great ability to be objective with themselves so that their performance is evaluated without as much emotionality towards it. It doesn't mean that they're any less driven to excel. It means that when they fall short or when they excel, they're, they're equally as objective and it's a form of feedback, right? Like when you go and compete, it's a test and being able to grade that test is essential, good or bad, because then it helps to guide the next steps, right? So they're also, you know, they're long-term thinkers, they're long-term uh, performers. They're not just seeing today in isolation. They're seeing today in the bigger picture. Now, again, that doesn't take away from their desire to excel today because they know that when they excel today, they're going to also be learning at a very high level. And this is a, a relationship that I talk a lot about in my second book, that that performance and learning are innate, are like intimately tied. They're kind of like yin and yang. And, and so when you're performing at a very high level, you're also learning at a very high level. So, so they're driven to excel because of what it allows them to, to accomplish today and what it's also going to lead uh, towards tomorrow. They're constantly seeking uh, the advice and counsel of other people. They understand their own biases or their own limitations in their thinking, and they're looking for other people you know, to shed light on their weak spots, to shed light on their, uh, their blind spots. Uh, but they're also not going to do so blindly. Right? They have a sense of their skill set. And so when there are things that you know, are brought to their attention that seem you know, irrelevant, right? they're not going to give it a second thought. Maybe down the line they will again, but you know, that relevancy for them is very temporal. I mean, like it's, it's relevant today. You know, they're not going to say, they're not going to focus too much on the thing that is going to be very relevant for them you know, two years from now. They might note it you know, so they don't forget it, but they're not going to overemphasize it today. I think those are a lot of the big ones. I mean, you know, like mental toughness and, you know, the, having the right temperament, and the right personality, you know, those are things I think are things that are, are very personal. Right? I try not to get into the, the personal, you know, characteristics or dynamics that make up kind of the ideal, because I think there's a lot of ways to, to accomplish it. And if you have some of the more basic essential elements, you know, however your personality allows you to, to materialize it uh, is, is kind of the fun of it, kind of the diversity of it. I think one of the most critical things you mentioned is, is the importance of feedback and actively seeking out your weaknesses and your flaws, but also in a way that you're aware of, you know, not, you, you have to be very cognizant of what is the source of the feedback and is this particular piece of advice or whatever it might be relevant to where I am now and what I'm trying to do. Yeah, it's very easy, you know, and I'll say it this way. It's easy for people to get caught up in, in taking advice from many, many different people. But when that happens, it's evidence of a weakness in confidence. And that weakness in confidence might be because you don't understand your skill set well enough. And, and so there, there is, you know, a perceptual weakness, not an actual weakness, right? So the perception gets strengthened when you have a more clear understanding of what your skills actually are. So then you get to take that understanding and match it with the feedback that you're getting rather than getting pulled in many, many different directions because you know, you're allowing it to happen because you don't have that, that centering, that grounding that comes from you know, being the one who is in control of your performance, right? As the athlete, you're the one that has to do it. There's no one that can actually do it for you right? The people around you are, are supporting your ability to do that. Uh, and if you're getting pulled in many directions, it means that there's just some inner knowledge that that's lacking. Uh, longtime listeners will know that I'm an, I'm an avid poker player. I'd love to dig in a little bit to some poker specific stuff. Um, you, I'm sure we touched on some of the sort of conceptual framework behind this, but let's, let's get back into kind of smashing computers and <laughs> Um, ripping, you know, mice from the wall. How do you uh, recommend or what are some strategies specifically for things like tilt control? And for those who may not know, would you kind of briefly explain what tilt is? 
Yeah. So tilt, I, I'll actually say it in two ways because tilt before I came into poker was a poker player's way of saying that like any reason that they would play less than their best would be called tilt. Now tilt as I define it is, is about anger, right? When I've studied poker players for years and I'm not really a very good poker player myself. I'm right. I'm, I'm kind of the outsider that came in and, and, and observe what was going on. Like well over 80% of the conversations that players were having or the descriptions they were giving about tilt meant that they got angry and they were doing stupid stuff and they were losing, right? Very rarely are players tilting and winning, right? They're usually tilting because they're losing and then, and or their tilt is causing them to lose. Uh, so the strategies for correcting tilts are identical to the things that we've already mapped out in terms of the framework. And, and what I've done in, in my first book was to map out uh, seven different types of tilt that I, I just observed. And to date, I mean, my first book came out over five years ago. Uh, no one has yet been able to come up with another type of tilt uh, that can explain a situation at the poker table where somebody would get pissed off. Uh, so I, I continue to have that challenge out there and certainly welcome anybody that can find another one. And the reason is because each of these seven types of tilts are focused on that root cause, right? There are hundreds of reasons why poker players tilt, right? The triggers that we were talking about earlier. Hundreds of reasons why players get have their tilt triggered, but there are only a handful of them when you dig down beneath the surface and see what's going on. So the first type, so when we're talking about solving tilt, right, you've got to understand what's causing it. And by mapping these out in seven, you know, I think that's, that's helped a lot of players be able to narrow down uh, their focus so that they could actually solve their tilt problem. Uh, the first one's called running bad tilt. Right? Running bad tilt in poker means that you're losing a lot in sort of short succession. And a bad run of cards basically means you're just getting a lot of bad luck in short succession, right? So, you, so if you were flipping coins, uh, you know, you should, right? The math says that, you know, half the time you're going to flip heads, half the time you're going to you know, flip tails. Well, what about when you flip uh, a coin and 10 times in a row it comes up tails? And you're betting on heads, right? So now you've had a bad run. That's a very simple example for those who don't play poker to understand that there's a lot of math involved uh, in, in poker. And, and you get into situations where uh, the bad luck is just against you. And there's, there's literally nothing you can do other, other than to continue to play a very strong, strategically profitable long-term strategy. Uh, but obviously, that's not what happens to a lot of players. They, they handle that bad run by getting angry and then playing worse. They try to recapture their money. They try to force the action. They try to be more aggressive and make more money. And of course, you know, the good players are waiting for that to happen because that's what bad players do. And so a good player can turn into a bad player very quickly when they're on tilt. Uh, so running bad tilt is one. Uh, the second one is called uh, injustice tilt. You know, the, the name should imply it, right? This is a feeling like what's happening is unfair, unjust, as if the poker gods are against them. Uh, entitlement tilt is the next one. And entitlement tilt and injustice tilt are very similar in terms of the language, right? But with entitlement tilt, it's more of a sense of deserving. It's a more personal feeling, right? As I mentioned earlier, it's, it's overconfidence. Injustice is more kind of outwardly. It's more about like what the poker gods or what, what poker is not giving to you. You're not getting what you deserve. Whereas with entitlement, it's a feeling of superiority over other players, right? You're better than this player, so you deserve to win. Not like you're getting bad cards and feeling a sense of injustice. Uh, hate losing tilt, right? Otherwise known as competitive tilt, right? These are the, the very highly competitive people who just hate losing. And, and that losing causes a lot of anger. Uh, mistake tilt is the next one. We talked about that one already. Revenge tilt, one of my always favorites, uh, just because players just get so crazy and they start attacking others. And it's amusing for me. Um, desperation tilt is the last one. And desperation tilt is not necessarily a unique type of tilt. Any of the other types of tilt that I've mentioned can cause desperation tilt. But I specifically kind of carve out desperation tilt because it is the line between a poker player who is successful, who is profitable, that is having a very, very difficult time controlling themselves with a player who actually has a gambling problem, right? Desperation tilt is a performance issue. A gambling problem is somebody who can't handle the losses, doesn't have actual skill in the game, and needs, you know, clinical help. I'm, I, I am trained as a therapist, uh, but I'm not practicing as one. I, I, I am a coach working in performance. And yes, I do get into personal issues because inevitably they are often part of, you know, a player's performance, but that's not my primary area of focus. And I refer anybody that I believe that has a gambling problem 
to therapists who are specialized in that. So, so desperation tilt, you know, oftentimes includes players like jumping up in stakes, right? So they start playing for a lot more money than their bankroll can support, right? They're basically playing for all their money, right? As a poker player, you have to have the ability to tolerate a lot of losses, right? And if you, if you don't have the cash to support the fluctuations in your profitability, then, then you can go bust. And that's what ends up happening to a lot of poker players. They end up playing for all of their bankroll, right? They've got $20,000 and they really should only be playing for, you know, 200 to $400 at a time. And they go play against a very skilled player for 20 grand. And, you know, most likely they're going to lose it. Now, of course they can get lucky in that spot, uh, but that's not going to solve their desperation tilt problem. The funny thing about a lot of these forms of tilt, especially, you know, things like injustice tilt, entitlement tilt, mistake tilt, you see the same exact thing sabotaging many people in all kinds of different areas of life. So for somebody who's listening that thinks these mistakes are only things that apply to poker players, I think you're sorely mistaken. <laughs> I completely agree. One other concept I wanted to to dig into is, is, and we touched on this earlier, is the concept or the idea of specifically in poker, and I think in many areas of life like trading, investing, a lot of business decisions, um, there's a huge gap between, you know, making the correct decision and seeing the results that you would like. How do you help people cope with that? We're talking about uncertainty, right? And so, you know, in all of those spheres, we're trying to narrow in on this idea of, you know, what happened, right? You hit a poor golf shot, you make an investment that doesn't pay off, you open up a business uh, that doesn't work out and, and you want to know why, right? And, and very often you can't get an answer that satisfies you to 100%. But as it turns out, psychological research doesn't have that standard. And I'm saying that particularly because in statistics, there's, there's what's called a confidence interval, right? And so in psychological research, the research that gets published has uh, over a 95% reliability that the data is, is representing uh, the, the effect that they're seeing. So, right? so, so what you can do is you can start to create confidence intervals, right? I'm, I'm 30% sure, I'm 50% sure, I'm 70% sure that, that what happened was X. And what that does is it keeps you open-minded so that uh, as you go in and make other investments, open other businesses, uh, talk to other people who have open businesses or, you know, hit other golf shots, play more poker, right? That you can start to gather more information that's going to raise your confidence interval to the point that you may eventually know what happened two years ago, but it may take you two years to know for sure. But you're not stopping everything to find out what happened to 100% because you might have to go and kind of continue to play the game, whatever game that is that you're playing in order to have that confidence interval rise. And I think that's a mistake that a lot of people make. They, they end up getting paralyzed uh, after you know some some big things happen, and that paralysis makes them a little bit gun shy to take additional steps, and and they they kind of want to be more right. They want to avoid having another misstep. And I think to a degree, you know, that can be evidence of a confidence problem, right? At at a, at a deeper level, if they don't have the confidence to be able to learn from it, to be able to absorb it, their expectations might to be be too high. They might think that they ought to be in more control of the outcome. They may think that the success that they had early on meant that they were guaranteed to have success, and so they got a little bit lazy, staying sharp and reevaluating the the investment. And maybe had they relooked at it, you know, three months before things went belly up, the writing was on the wall, but they were you know, kind of blinded by it, right? Same thing with a business, same thing as a golfer, right? Golfers who might get on a good run, you know, things are going really well, might not be taking care of their bodies as well. And so they start uh, not sleeping as much and, and their performance can start to dissipate as a result of it. So the point is that you're trying to gain information that will help you to, to become certain, but you're not doing so by just staying on the sidelines, right? That you have to kind of keep getting back in the game and gaining more information because that's generally the only place that you can do that. So what is one piece of homework that you would give people listening to this podcast? Map your problems. You know, like I, I guess I spoke a lot about earlier on. Um, they happen in predictable patterns. Very often people are blind to them. They, they happen. And, and sometimes when they happen, they're like, ah, it was a one-off, right? That's so unlike me. I'll never do that again. You know, two days later, it happens again. A month later, it happens again, right? So you, you kind of have to take away that the irrationality of it. You have to take away the unpredictability of it and, and assume that all of the emotional issues that are getting in the way of you performing or succeeding at the level that you want are, are happening in very predictable patterns. 
and your job is to uncover that prediction. And the data is there, right? And, and like a lot of things, right, as, as you pay more attention to it, uh, as you learn more, right, you develop more skill. And in this particular case, right, you, you actually create vision for yourself. It's like, it's like you're wearing a, a very dark pair of glasses. Uh, and then over time, as you gain greater clarity and recognition, those glasses become less dark and become uh, clearer. You, you see the pattern. And, and it's not enough to just be able to see the pattern kind of off the felt, right, out of the action. You have to be able to see it in real time. So if right now you can see the pattern, but in the moment you can't, then it's about training or it's about recognizing the accumulated emotion that's rapidly overwhelming your ability to, to see. But yeah, mapping, mapping is the number one priority. That's why I have all my clients fill out a very detailed questionnaire before we even get started because that helps them and me to gain a sense of, of what is going on. And, you know, when I come across players, you know, there's been a handful of times where I've attempted to sell my services to, to people uh, who weren't ready. Uh, and, and when that happens, it fails. I've had almost zero success selling myself to somebody who wasn't ready. And at this point, uh, I've stopped trying. <laughs> and, and, and in large measure, it's because they don't see it, right? And, and I can't force them to see something that they're not ready to see. So, so if you are ready to see, start doing the mapping and, and, and paying very close attention to, to what's getting in your way because you can't get it out of your way. You can't solve it uh, until you can see it. What are some resources that you would recommend for listeners who want to do some more research on some of the stuff we've talked about today? Uh, that's a good question. Um, obviously, my books <laughs> are, are helpful resources. They're, they're written in the language of poker. There may be very few poker players uh, that are listening, which I understand. I, I think The Power of Habit is a great book. I guess I'm giving more sort of general resources, not necessarily particular to, to what we're discussing here. Deep Work by Cal Newport, I think, is a fantastic book. The Feeling of What Happens by Antonio Damasio. Uh, it's been around for, uh, I think, 10, 15 years now, but, it, but it's a great book as well. Fooled by Randomness, <laughs> I think, is, is a must-read uh, by most people. Um, you, know, you don't necessarily have to read the entire thing to get you know, the, the, the basic premises of it. Yeah, those are the big ones that come to mind. And where can people find you online? JaredTendler.com, uh, JaredTendlerPoker.com. Uh, they can also follow me on Twitter, uh, at Jared Tendler. Awesome. Well, Jared, thank you so much. This has been incredibly insightful. I'm happy to hear that, Matt, and uh, thanks for having me. Thank you so much for listening to The Science of Success. Listeners like you are why we do this podcast. The emails and stories we receive from listeners around the globe bring us joy and fuel our mission to unleash human potential. I'd love to hear from you. I read and respond to every email that listeners send me. My email is matt, that's M-A-T-T, at scienceofsuccess.co. That's matt at scienceofsuccess.co. I would love to hear from you. The greatest compliment you can give us is a referral to a friend either live or online. If you've enjoyed this episode, please leave us an awesome review and subscribe on iTunes because that helps more and more people discover the science of success. And as a thank you to you for being awesome listeners, I'm giving away a $100 Amazon gift card. All you have to do to be entered to win is to text the word SMARTER, that's S-M-A-R-T-E-R, to the number 44222. Thanks again, and we'll see you on the next episode of The Science of Success.